Hello learners, I uh, hope you're keeping well. Today we're covering climate and weather and our main focus is valley climates. Okay, and here we have to the curriculum states that we will look at slope aspect, we look at development of anabatic, catabatic, the inversions or thermal belt, frost pockets, and radiation fog. And we're going to look at simple sketches to try and get a better understanding of these concepts. All right, then we're going to look at the influence on human activities. So let's get going. All right, the first one we're going to look at is slope aspect. Now, before I even look at that, valley climates is microclimate. All right. It's also known as local climate. This climate is local to the area, like your valley climates. All right. If there's a valley there, it's going to happen. If there's no valley, uh, it's not going to happen. You understand? So uh, it's specific to specific areas. It's, and the valley will have specific uh, weather conditions related to these different climatological phenomenon that occur in it. So the first one we're going to look at then is slope aspect. And slope aspect is the angle at which the sun's rays strike a slope. All right. It will determine which slope gets more sunlight, which slope gets less sunlight. All right. So if we look at this, this is the equator. All right southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere all right now if you look at the sun's rays it will strike certain facing slopes and when you realize the direction you realize that in the southern hemisphere the north facing slopes will receive more sunlight and in the northern hemisphere the south facing slopes will receive more sunlight, all right? So we worked that out based on the direction or angle at which the sun's ray strikes a slope. So we picked it up that in the northern hemisphere, the south facing slopes receive, and I must get my head out of here, receive more sunlight than the north facing slopes. And in the southern hemisphere, the north facing slopes receive more sunshine or sunlight than the south facing slopes. Okay, we picked that up. So in other words, if you just take specific or pay specific attention to the southern hemisphere, we will find that in the southern hemisphere, north facing slopes are hot, sunny, and dry because they're getting the sunlight, there's evaporation, more evaporation rather than the other slopes. And in the south facing slopes, they are cool, shady, and they retain some of the moisture. Okay, so there's a difference between the two. Obviously, it's going to affect the activities, etc. So soils on the cooler south facing slopes, uh, soils are on cooler south facing slopes as they are in the shadow zone. They are cooler rather, maybe a little phrasing there. Okay, I apologize for that. They are cooler because they are in the shadow zone, something known as a shadow zone because it doesn't get direct sunlight. Okay, now let's look at the farmers. Farmers then have to select a slope which is best suited for certain crops. Now, it doesn't mean the south facing slope is bad and the north facing slope is good. There'll be different crops that will grow, uh, crops that can uh, require less moisture and more sunlight will grow on the north facing slopes, obviously, and in the, in the southern hemisphere, obviously. And the trees and shade loving plants like ferns will grow on the south facing slopes. Can you see this activity on both slopes? And I'm going to go up here. You can see this trees and there's, it's drier here. So obviously in the southern hemisphere, 
This will be the south facing slopes and this will be the north facing slopes. Okay, you see clear differentiation. Also we know that humans tend to build their houses on the north facing slopes, generally speaking. Maybe somebody likes a lot of cold and whatever they'll go on the other slope. But generally speaking, humans tend to build their houses on the north facing slopes in the southern hemisphere because it is warmer. Okay, we find that choice. Of course, if they've got a choice. Okay, uh, so that's what happens there. All right. Let's look at another two concepts that happen in a valley. All right, we look at the anabatic. My apologies, I'm getting old, so I need some coffee. Okay, uh, we look at the anabatic and catabatic winds of flow. Okay, let's look at the anabatic first. All right, we can see the sun is shining. That already tells us it happens during the day. Now, what else happens if the sun is shining? Can you see the warm surface here? So the surface of the slope is getting heated. So when the slopes are warm due to insulation, incoming solar radiation. So it warms the slope. All right. And if it warms the slope, what happens to the air above it? It also warms up. So the air above the slope warms, becomes lighter, and rises up the slopes of the valley. Okay, so it moves up the slopes of the valley. And that is your anabatic. Please, when you're writing an exam, don't say it just goes, rises up. It can be anything, doesn't have to be an anabatic flow if you just say rises. You have to say it rises up the slope, okay? It rises up the slope or it moves up the slope due to heating. You have to mention the word slope, okay, in that. All right, now let's take the catabatic flow. You see the moon here, all right? So clear it's night time. Okay, the surface is cooling. Why? Terrestrial radiation is being given off. So it occurs during the night, catabatic, when the slopes cool due to terrestrial radiation. Now, obviously, if the surface cools, what happens to the air above it? The air above the slopes also become cold and dense. And watch this and becomes dense, what it does next? Sinks down the valley slopes. Not sinks down, down the valley slopes. You understand, we have to mention the valley slopes. So it's associated with cold conditions. And also, depending on the season, we get frost occurring near the bottom or generally at the bottom of the valley. Of course, this can have a negative impact. It damages crops. That is why people plant, if they're farming down there at the bottom, they have to plant frost resistant crops. And again, I mentioned the cold conditions. It's, a, it's an uncomfortable condition for people, obviously because it's very, very cold at times. Again, depending on the season. If it's winter, it tends to get very cold. All right, and also you may get fog in the area, which creates poor visibility. So it's more expenses for farmers to plant frost resistant crops, to put nets across the, uh, the orchards or whatever, you understand, to save them from the frost. So these steps have to be taken because impacts negatively on that, please. Some people come across and say, this wind blows the houses away, etc. It's not such a strong breeze that it may cause damage to formal housing and things like that. All right, let's go on. Then the thermal belt, what is this? All right, now let's look at it. We find it's more centrally located here, eh? towards the middle of the valley, can you see? Let's see what happens here. 
It is a layer of warm air trapped between two layers of cold air. So we're assuming it's cold here and it's cold here. Okay, let's make sense of why this is happening. During the nights, especially cold and calm winter's nights, I'm sounding like a poet now. All right, this is when it occurs mostly. Doesn't mean it doesn't occur when it's not like this. Due to terrestrial radiation in the upper slopes, air cools, becomes dense, and flows down the slope. So what is that? Already that is a form of catabatic winds. Okay, when it's cold, it flows down the slope. And there's little warmer winds at the bottom, more warmer air at the bottom. What does it do to that warmer air? It comes in and pushes the warmer air up. Okay, it's pushing the warm air up and the cold air takes over this area now. It's dominating this area, it takes over and pushes the warm air up. You understand? Now from the top, obviously it's cold. There's subsiding air coming in. Okay, so it's cold there and the cold air is pushed here. What happens to the warm air? It gets trapped between these two layers of cold air. And that is your thermal that. So we have cold air above and cold air below and the warm air in between. Okay, it's like a belt of warm air running across the valley, okay, towards the middle of the valley. All right, that's your thermal belt. It is a form of inversions because the colder air is here and as you move up into the thermal belt, the temperature increases. All right, you've got that, learners, the thermal belt. Now, the impact of the thermal belt, a people will build their houses halfway up the slope of the valley to be in the warmer thermal belt. So they can build here. Do you understand in these areas? They will build because it's warmer there, especially during the winter time, etc. You've got in the warmer thermal belt, you've got more comfort, human comfort conditions. Crops that need warm, frost-free conditions will be planted in the thermal belt. Example, sugarcane, all right? Because it needs warmth. It can't survive under frost. Okay, so it can be planted in the thermal belt regions. So it has its advantages, eh? Okay, right. The next one we look at is frost pockets. Now let's look at what happens here. It is a name for a low-lying area. Example, the valley bottom or a smaller hollow, okay, where frost occurs more frequently than the surrounding area. That's why we call it pockets of frost in the low-lying area of the bottom, uh, valley bottom. You understand the bottom of the valley where you get these frost pockets occurring. All right. Now, when does it occur? You can see the frost pocket down here. Okay, when does it occur? They normally occur after dry and clear and cold nights. Now what happens here? The cold air drains down the slopes, so it's associated with catabatic winds again, or catabatic flow again. Can you see it? That's the bugger, all right, bringing all these conditions. Okay, and there's one very important condition. The dew point temperature, the temperature at which condensation takes place must be below freezing point. Because if it's below freezing point, it's below zero, it's minus one, then what happens when it occurs and it reaches dew point, the air reaches dew point temperature? You're not gonna get droplets of water because it's below freezing point. You will form or ice crystals will form. So it condenses to ice crystals because the temperature is below freezing point of zero degrees. So you get this ice and this is known as your frost, forming those frost pockets where the cold air collects down here. Can you see it? All right. So once again, it's similar to the catabatic winds. If there's frost in the area, it damages vegetation and crops. People have to plant frost resistant crops in the area if they already settle there, all right? And it also is very cold and uncomfortable, 
Okay, that's your frost pockets. And radiation form was the other one. Okay, now let's look at what's happening here. Heat is being given off from the surface. All right, can you see it? And as it's given off, due to terrestrial radiation. So the ground becomes cool at night due to terrestrial radiation, surface giving off the heat, the radiation, all right? Now what's gonna to happen to the air above it? The air above it will also cool the air above, all right? And now this is the special thing. When the air is below dew point temperature, it causes the water vapor to condense, obviously around dust and other particles. Those are condensation nuclei. And when it condenses around that, okay, it creates the radiation fog. Can you see that? Why are we calling radiation fog? Because it's associated with radiation. First, your terrestrial radiation, and you're getting this radiation fog occurring. It's like a cloud near the surface, eh? Do you notice that is your radiation fog? Now, what happens in the mornings? I know people in valleys and things will notice that in the morning, the sun's rays will heat up the surface. The surface is getting heated here. What happens to the air above it? It also starts getting heated, and it turns into vapor. All right, and vapor, and vapor, and vapor. And as it carries on, you understand, eventually the fog goes, you understand? So we actually say the warm air rises, all right, in the area, okay? And as it rises, it evaporates, okay, becoming vapor. And some people say the fog lifts. All right, it's like lifting from the surface and eventually it's gone. During the time it's there, it does affect visibility, right? And of course, you can talk about when it's poor visibility, you can have car accidents, etc. Okay, learners, and that is radiation fog. All right, uh, generally, this is a summary of your valley climates. Uh, learners, I hope it made sense to you. All the best. Goodbye.